Peace exists nowhere in the world. It exists not in meditation halls, temples, or in the company of friends. It exists not in the family, with the priest, or the psychotherapist. If God has peace, it is his alone. Man cannot siphon it from him. Peace lies not in austerities, or prayers, or worship, or meditation. Peace lies not in any modality in existence. Peace, like freedom, exists in seeing things the way that they naturally exist. Peace lies in extricating oneself from the belief that others will provide for them, give them happiness, comfort them, and make them whole. Peace lies in the natural desire to see the truth. The people of this world live for themselves. Living under the weight of a tyrannical mind, each is lost in a struggle to survive. Living under fire from missiles of thought, belief, and opinion, each is a wounded soldier on the battlefield, attempting to hobble his bloody carcass to safety. Man lives under a guillotine of right and wrong. Society, the mind, and the world hold this idea over his head. However, no man can know what is right and what is wrong. Right and wrong are arbitrary concepts that have no standard of truth against which to compare. Man is given many examinations for which there is no answer key. A life devoted to the procurement of pleasure is a life lived in endless pain. Pleasure cannot satisfy, leaving the man in a constant state of hunger. Peace is not found in the company of others, doing for others, needing for others, or relying upon others. For the other does not, in truth, exist. He is a scapegoat for man's failures. He is a repository for man's endless needs. He is a well without water. Peace lives inside of truth. Truth lives inside of no man. Truth is truth. It is a cloud that moves according to a precise wind. It is a wave that ripples across the sea. It is impersonal, uncompassionate. It is neither good or evil. It has no interest in or cognizance of the ways of man. The truth lies not in facing things. The truth lies not in fleeing them. The truth is the recognition of what there is to face and what is creating the compulsion to flee. The truth lies not in spirituality, for spirituality is an image that man attempts to live up to. A new mask, a new ideal, a new makeover. The truth lies not in the pursuit of success, for success itself chases seriousness and sincerity. The truth lies not in kindness or compassion. Such things arise naturally. When a man gains freedom from his lifelong burdens, where there is a sincere longing for truth, where there is a desperate and serious search for truth, it will be found. If a man is inspired by Jesus or Buddha, if he is smitten by the things that they discovered, if for him it is natural to devote his life to finding it, he will move toward truth, for he will have the seriousness and sincerity to immediately abandon that which is not truth. Peace is not found from people. It is found away from them. Peace is not found in the world. It is found despite the world. Truth is not found in relationship. It is not found fleeing relationship. It is found in one's choiceless desire to discover it. Wherever one may be, one day a man will die. The certainty of this occurrence, looming large within his mind, brings him many benefits. As he lays dying upon his deathbed, he will say, I love you to his loved ones. If he has loved or if he has not, what does it matter? What do such words and sentiment bring him in tangible value? His words will be written upon the surface of wet stones, like the multitudes who have gone before him. As he looks back upon his life, it matters not whom he has loved. It matters what he has invested, invested into his karmic future. Did he discover truth while he was alive? Did he find a way to end his samsaric cycle? Did he free himself of all his worldly illusions and become privy to universal knowledge? Did he take full advantage of the human powers that nature invested him with? Such investments would have indeed had a tangible value, not only in his life, but in the beyond. 
I am only here for a short time, and I will proclaim from the heavens, do not waste your life. The mind is a sea of lies. The people of the world are empty. The world itself is a paper mache of high-pitched sirens and neon lights. There is nothing of any tangible value anywhere in a life traditionally and domestically lived. The truth is the only thing that works because it is the only thing there is. In this world, material wealth is common. Professional glory is common. Success is common. But peace is rarer than the rarest of jewels. Man has found ingenious ways to build skyscrapers that tower over cities, highways that connect nations, and jets that travel at the speed of sound. But he has yet to find his way to peace. The irony is that virtually everything a man does he does for peace, but he calls it by another name. Whether it is winning, success, riches, fame, or achievement, he does it for self-satisfaction, and he does it for peace. And when he doesn't find it, he feels that if he just achieves more, he may find it. It is one of life's many peculiarities that that which is done for peace never works, and that which is done out of peace never fails. Those who have achieved greatness in their field of work have articles written in their name. Those who have found peace have had religions created in their name. But those who follow the religions rarely find peace. For the man in whose name the religion was created was not in search of creating a religion. He was not in search of a teacher to follow or a god to worship. For he traveled for much of his life in search of such things. And when he failed to find them, he became his own God. Shall I tell you why it is so rare? Shall I tell you when peace will come to you? I cannot give you the date, but I can give you the day. The reason that peace has not come to you is this. You believe that the world has something to give you. You believe that somewhere on that glorious and distant horizon, there is something that waits for you. And for as long as you are mesmerized by this idea, you will not have peace. It is perhaps the case that the universe likes to play games with us human beings. You see, the man who always tells the truth is trustworthy. The man who always tells a lie is equally trustworthy. But the man who sometimes lies and sometimes tells the truth is dangerous. For you can never be sure if what he is telling you today is the truth or a lie. Perhaps the universe is similar to this dangerous man. And perhaps this is her way of weeding out the seekers from the non-seekers. Perhaps this is her way of choosing those few individuals to whom she will whisper her secrets. A man suffers a series of misfortunes, and he feels that all is doomed. But then, he is given a grand stroke of fortune, and he suddenly feels that there is hope. This hope turns his sights toward the horizon, waiting for more fortune to come his way. But instead, he gets tossed about by life, and then he receives another token for his troubles. Perhaps the token for his troubles is the universe's way of keeping him hooked, so that he can get slapped again and again. Five parts doomed to one part happiness. Not a good deal, wouldn't you say? When will you find peace? Before I answer this question, please understand that I am not asking you to do anything. For prescriptions don't work. All of your efforts will go astray. You will find peace, not by achievement, and not by force. When it comes, it will arise within you. And it will come not through effort, but understanding. When you have seen through the charade, when you see that the world has nothing to offer you, when you see that life is an experience rather than a progression, you will turn your gaze away from the horizon. And when the horizon disappears, peace will at once appear. So do not stop what you are doing. Please, by all means, have your fill. Strive and achieve and claw and grind and experience all that you feel the need to experience. And when you have had your fill, when the recurring patterns become clear to you, when you discover the endless circle that you have spent lifetimes traveling, you will perhaps drop it all 
And when you do, peace will find you. And when it does, you need not live in a cave, or join a commune, or shave your head, or don holy attire. You may continue your life as you always have, but you will do so as a different person. The quality of what you experience will drip with nectar. Your productivity will increase tenfold. And where you once looked into the horizon, you will now look four inches in front of you. Not because you have found it, but because you have finally understood that there has never been anything to find. I come to you with words, but the experience is not describable. Nevertheless, I will do my best. Habit, adaptation, routine. These are the most powerful forces in the daily existence of man. Life becomes this routine automaticity, and every person and thing that he lives with become routine and commonplace. The people in his life become no different than the furniture. He never really sees them. They are just in the vicinity. He relates to them in his habitual way. They say something, and he always gives the same response. He says something, and they always give the same response. Everything in his life is put in a permanent compartment. His religious beliefs, his political views, his views on parenting, his stances on all things have been declared, and they have been for years. This man will live this way for all of his life. He will live in this fog until the day he dies, never having tasted enlightenment. Your mind will perhaps tell you that I'm advocating that you look at views that oppose your own to entertain different political or religious beliefs, or look at things from another's perspective. Not at all, for that is also a fog. Gandhi once said, we need to be careful about how we choose our next leader, for an Indian tyrant is no better than a British one. When the fog lifts, you have this incredibly bitter sweet feeling. It is just as tragic as it is mesmerizing. Perhaps the best way I can describe is to say that it is a painful liberation. It is liberation because after so many years, the fog has lifted and you are suddenly able to see. But as the sun of freedom rises, it illuminates the skeletal remains, the empty cans, the overgrowth of weeds, and a dense smoke of stagnation. You suddenly see what your life has become in your absence. While you were away, there were uprisings, your home has been pilfered, and your children have grown into adults. You were there for all of this. In fact, you created all of this. But you were in a fog. So you were never really there at all. You might as well have been away at war. This is the pain, and it is tremendous. Within your heart, however, you feel this concomitant sense of freedom, this sense that you have finally arrived, this urgency. You feel that you finally have the clarity and the power to set things right, and you cannot wait to do so. This is the feeling you get. You are incredibly anxious to get started, to make up for time lost. You have become free. This is what you've always wanted, but you never knew quite how it would come. And when you begin to make amends, the first thing you notice is that everyone's voice sounds different because you are hearing it for the first time after so many years. The fog has lifted. Your senses have become keen and you no longer see through the dense prism of the mind. You see what is. To me, it happened after a dream. It was so powerful that it woke me up. I rose and sat on the edge of the bed. I had the feeling which said, where am I? Then I began to see the barren landscape and I felt, what have I been doing? Where have I been? I immediately realized what St. Francis of Assisi felt because I felt like running in the streets and going door to door for no particular reason at all. But I had a fear as well. And the fear was, what if this goes away? I never want to go back. What if the fog settles back in? There was a cataclysm happening within me. A very gentle smile settled upon my lips. It felt as if the lips had reached their perfect resting spot. Every so slightly curled at the edges, not fully a smile, 
but a serenity. I was transforming. My path was set, first for my own life, and then for the lives of others. Certain, specific others, who had the sincere longing. I did not know it at the time, but what I am doing today is what I was created by the universe to do, to bring others across the river, into another world. It will be a painful liberation for you, as well, my friend, but it will be life in all its glory. You will finally arrive at the place from which you are able to do what needs to be done. Go where you need to go, give what needs to be given, and feel what needs to be felt. Of one thing, I am now certain. To experience this is the one and only reason we are here. To not experience it is to never have been here at all. A man begins with a dream. He sees others who have achieved this dream. He enters the environment of those who are pursuing the same dream. In this environment, there are many complex forces afoot, forces that he will likely never realize. If he is of a particular DNA, he will realize them, but it will take many years to do so. Everything in this environment, from the methods pursued, to the techniques touted, to the language that is used to the lingo that is created, are a slow moving tide that moves against this man. This environment is fundamentally an environment of struggle. The vast majority who live in this environment never achieve their dream. They struggle for their entire lives, eventually dropping it to pursue real jobs. This environment is known as the culture. Each discipline in every field has its own culture. A culture moves against a human. It is a thick, dark cloud of beliefs opinions, showmanship, nepotism, old wives' tales, and untruths. It is founded upon ideas touted by scientists, experts, researchers, practitioners, and the experiences of those who have been a part of the culture for their entire lives. A culture is a stagnant pond. It attracts vermin, flies, and mosquitoes. The water never flows. The air never moves. All cultures are based upon profound untruths, fundamental inconsistencies that move against the progression of man. It is this invisible force that is responsible for the fact that less than 1% in any field become truly elite. The elite do not become elite because of the culture. They become elite despite it. A man finds himself doing what others in the culture do. He finds himself struggling in the same ways and he finds himself commiserating in the same way. These are soldiers who are fighting an enemy that they do not know exists. Some of what the culture says seems intensely logical. That which does not seem logical, the man is instructed to take on faith. Realizing that he has not achieved his dream and being given examples of the few who have, he has little reason not to take their word. He enters the world of competition he asks the questions already being asked. He plays the game already being played and becomes a struggling cog in the wheel. What is the truth? The truth lies beyond all cultures. The truth cannot exist in any group, institution, method, or technique. The truth lies in seriousness and away from the pleasure of reward. Every game addles into complexity once touched by the hand of man, it becomes what it was never meant to become. It becomes work. It becomes a striving. It becomes a chore. Such is not the way to mastery. Mastery lies in reducing the game into its simplest elements. It lies in identifying the game for what it truly is. This, in itself, can take a man decades. For his eyes have become so accustomed to the smoke of convention he has become colorblind to the truth, the conditioned man cannot see. What is the game, and what is it not? What does the game ask, and what does it not care about? What promises has a man fallen for? What has he taken on faith? How far from his own natural state has he strayed? The master is not the one who harbors the greatest technique. The master is he who has spent his years understanding the true nature of the game. 
in every field, business, sport, and otherwise. There is almost no one who understands the nature of the game, for man is a creature who has been conditioned to act. He is a creature who has been conditioned to seek instruction and progress and compete. He has never given himself time to truly examine. Golf is not what a man thinks it is, nor is baseball, nor is marketing, nor is finance, nor is spirituality, nor is anything. A man who does not understand the game has only one option, fight and compete. The man who understands the game asks fundamentally different questions. Thus, giving birth to a path through back doors, unavailable to the rest. The game must be discovered with innocent eyes, with an unencumbered mind, through an unprescribed vantage point. There are things that veterans of the game will never come to know. For their eyes of innocence were lost long ago. The truth is that nature gave man what no culture can ever give him. It is here he must begin. For what awaits him is beyond the comprehension of the conditioned lot and beyond any dream he has ever dared to dream. Have you heard of the remora? They are a type of fish which attach themselves to a large sea-dwelling host, such as a great white shark. They ride their host throughout the world's great oceans. It seems that man, who by his nature is mightier than the great white, seems to have gone the way of the remora. He has grown accustomed to riding rather than driving. And because he has become attached to the idea that he must ride something, he spends his life awaiting the things which will propel him to where he wishes to go. It is a lamentable turn of events, is it not? The being that is made of the magic dust that propels the mighty planets in their orbit. The being that is the consciousness of all that is considered to be life. The being that is blessed with the power to rise above his own great faculty of reason sits and waits. He waits for the next big wave, the next great event, the next great occurrence that will give him the momentum that he seeks. Professional athletes often speak of momentum. There is little harm in it, but it does beg a question. What does one do when the momentum is not before him? What does he do when circumstance is not in his esteemed favor? What does he do when the stars are still considering their quarterly alignment? He waits and he hopes, and he does so his entire life. His life becomes an exercise in endless waiting and hoping, punctuated by an occasional joy. And as he transitions from childhood to adulthood, he gradually begins to accept this dreadful deal. Throughout the expanse of time, man has suffered tremendously in this wait. What if there were a different way to live? What if the horizon was left to itself? What if a man took matters into his own hands and decided that he would wait no longer? What if when he looked into the mirror, he saw the visage of the mighty great white rather than that of the feeble remora? How could this happen? Is it practical? Is it doable? It depends. What does it depend upon? It depends upon one's attachment to that which he awaits. It depends upon who a man believes himself to be, as compared to what the future might bring to him. It depends upon his sensitivity to seeing what is real, rather than being mesmerized by what is not. But most of all, it depends upon how fed up he is with waiting, and how visceral is his excitement at the prospect of abandoning the search. A man's life is created in the most ingenious of ways, so ingenious, in fact, that it borders upon comedy. The universe has been created within him, but he is distracted by the one he sees outside of him. And when he sees his reflection, he looks at himself rather than into himself. Why? Because the eyes with which he looks are in search of something, and they are partial to form. It is said that when a man achieves enlightenment, he laughs, for he discovers that he has been searching his whole life to find that which he already possessed. And when he discovers this, he abandons the search. And when he abandons the search, life comes searching for him. 
You can create your gods. You can pray for angels. But a god whom you have never experienced can never be your god. The god who has never visited you in the expanse of daylight is of no use to you. The god who is yours is the one that hopes to find God. The source which gives rise to the thirst is the very same source that quenches it. Unless you understand that there is nothing to hope for, that there is nothing to come, that what you have now is of infinitely greater value than what might come tomorrow, you will forever lie in wait, and your life will pass you by. A man is his own God, for there can be no other. A man creates his own momentum, for that which he finds elsewhere soon fizzles. A man's life is not a stream of events, but a mystery to be lived within the cocoon of a single moment. And when he finds this moment, he will find sitting quietly within it his very own God. Miyamoto Musashi was the greatest swordsman the world has ever seen. His life spanned from the year 1584 to 1645. Musashi's father was a great swordsman and a great teacher of the sword. He trained the young Musashi, but Musashi was quite belligerent. He criticized his father and often belittled his ways. This did not sit well with his father, who considered his son to be insolent and disrespectful. One day when Musashi was 12, he criticized the way his father was shaving a stick. And his father became so angry, he picked up a sword and threw it at him, narrowly missing him. That day, the young Miyamoto left home. He trained himself in the jungles of Japan. He sought shelter in makeshift homes. He ate berries. He drank from the river. He remained wild and unkempt and began his journey to becoming the greatest swordsman who ever lived. He began to challenge prominent swordsmen. Upon seeing this wild and disheveled upstart, they grew increasingly confident that he was not in their league. They grew proud that he had not their breeding or their traditional methods of training. They used custom-made swords. He used a stick, and in 60 battles, he never lost a single one. It is, no doubt, a question of one's particular DNA, one's sensibilities. But when I first read the story of Miyamoto Musashi, I felt I had come home. As I read his story today, I think to myself, of course. It is interesting to note that during his time in the jungle, he spent most of his time training the mind. In the culture of the Japanese samurai, this was the way. The way was heavily influenced by Buddhist practices aimed at self-realization. I must confess that on an entirely personal level, what appeals to me most about Musashi was his utter disregard for the status quo and his training in the isolation of the jungle. It shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you that I have little regard for schools or academies or traditional methods of training, for I believe that such things create technicians rather than artists. They breed a common brand of mediocrity. They are wholly derivative and unoriginal. And unoriginal is precisely what their students become. While the traditionalists looked down at Masashi's wild and disorderly ways, he no doubt scoffed at the commonness of their style learned in the stale court of lofty tradition. It can be safely said that we gravitate toward those things and those people who are in keeping with our own DNA. We go to the ends of the earth in order to meet such people, to learn from them, and to have them be with us. For they are home. They are who we are. And if Musashi were alive today, no matter which part of Japan or in which jungle he roamed, I would go to him. For he is home. He is who I am. What does it take to be a modern day Musashi? I would say that it is far more about one's sensibilities and philosophies than it is about one's methodologies. Understand this. Methodologies sprout from core philosophies. And the primary philosophy of anyone who becomes truly great is a disregard for the status quo. It is to understand the unshakable truth that the masses are always wrong. It is to understand that the majority opinion in your profession is by definition 
wrong. Why? For a very simple reason. Because, regardless of the craft or the country in which it is practiced, the number of people in the entire world who devote their lives to, and who are willing to walk to the ends of the earth for, the truth could fit in a small room. A DNA thus wound is inconceivably rare in this world. It is this way in professional sports, business, spirituality, science, and whatever discipline you wish to name. Common is common for a reason. Inspirational inspires for a reason. It is far easier to teach a how than it is to teach a what. It is far easier to instruct than it is to elicit. It is far easier to tell than it is to show. It is far easier to come holding a recipe than it is to come empty-handed. It is far easier to come to the student hiding behind a how-to than is to stand and look him in the eye in order to discover who he is and the manner by which to make his greatness emerge. The norms and the traditions create a thick atmosphere of culture. And understand, my dear friend, that in such a culture, a human being's greatness lays buried never to see the light of day. And as he sinks deeper into the culture, he begins to lose his way. For what he often does not realize is that the successes that he once had came to him despite the culture and not because of it. What Musashi discovered in those ancient jungles of central Japan was something that the norms and the culture of his day would have certainly robbed him of. What Musashi discovered in the ancient jungles of central Japan was himself. He discovered the truth that others did not have the freedom to explore. For truth can only bloom in the wild and free world that is devoid of rules, culture, and tradition. I will tell you this. When I look into your eyes, I see the possibility of greatness. I see the bright and luminous reflection of the verdant jungles of the ancient East. I see Musashi standing behind you with his hands folded and his head bowed. For you are about to enter a journey that the world knows nothing about and emerge from it the sort of artist that it has never before seen. Humans live reactive lives. A person says, I don't care what they think of me. This is a reaction against an ego that cannot bear the fact that it is indeed affected by what others think of it. A person says, I will do exactly as I please, no matter what anyone says. This is a reaction against a fear of being controlled by the opinions of others. Who is the one that is truly immune to what others think? The one who acts in silence and makes not a single reactive statement. Careful. I know where you are going with this. You might get the bright idea of forcing yourself to remain silent and forcing yourself into not making a reactive statement. But this, too, would be a reaction. You will not have gone anywhere. Then what is the genuine characteristic of one who truly has become immune to what others think? What is it that clinches the deal, so to speak? The thought of what others may think does not even arise in his mind. This is the one who has arrived. This is always the case in any and all things. The title of this discourse will have created apprehension in the minds of some, for they will fear becoming narcissistic or cold. I do not subscribe to any ideas put forth by society. If it does not exist in nature, for me, it does not exist at all. What fundamentally is cold and narcissistic, and good, and compassionate, and sociopathic. These are all reactions. They are reactions against a fear of their opposite. A man fears being called a narcissist, so he becomes an empath. A man fears being called a pushover, so he becomes a disciplinarian. A disciplinarian fears being called cold, so he tries to become compassionate. Each is a face that man creates so that he can live with himself. Each is a face that man shows to the world so that he can avoid self-conflict. None of these things exist. They are constructs created by a society that has lost its way. A society whose foundation is fear. 
a society that has strayed so far from nature, there is no way back. Let us arrive at the truth. Why is it that man seeks validation from others? Because he is not content with who he is. He has holes that need to be filled. He has wounds that need attention. And where can he get such things but from the world around him? The question then becomes, why is he not content with who he is? Hasn't the world told him to love yourself and be happy with who you are? Certainly it has. But by doing so, the world has put him into a conundrum, you see. How can he love himself if he does not know what love truly is? How can he be happy with a self that he does not truly understand? Then what is the truth? The truth is the dirty little secret that the world will never tell you, for it does not fit its flowery narrative. The truth is that it is impossible for man to be content with who he is, and thus it is inevitable that he will look to the world to ease his discontentment. Why is it impossible for man to be content with who he is? Because the things that man believes himself to be are lights and shadows. One may be able to stand for a moment upon shifting sand, but it is impossible for him to build a home upon it. If a man is asked to describe himself, he might say, I am the founder of Company X. I am 32 years old. I am six feet tall. I enjoy hiking, climbing, and running. I have a lovely wife and three children, ages six, nine, and 12. I am a compassionate person, but of course I have my flaws. I get too angry sometimes. This is one of my great flaws, but I am heavily into self-improvement. I love to read books and talk with friends. I have many strong qualities. If one were to honestly examine what this man said, one quickly discovers that he hasn't said anything at all. What did this man say that is not shifting sand? What did he say that is firm and foundational enough to support a permanent home? Company X could go bankrupt. One small scandal, one bad business deal, one offhanded comment in the media, and the company could be gone. He knows this, and thus he lives in fear. Shifting sand. He is 32 years old and six feet tall. This 32 inches will one day become 72. And as his bones become brittle and his spine begins to bend with old age, the six feet will one day become five foot nine. Shifting sand. His wife may be with him forever. But if she is, there will likely be endless conflicts, subtle or grand. Or they may get a divorce. Shifting sand. His children will soon become adults, and they will leave their father's house forever. Shifting sand. All of man's ideas, thoughts, and beliefs about who he is are an attempt to hold on to shifting sand. There is nothing solid to be found. Because there is nothing solid there, how can he possibly become content? How can one become content in something that is poorly understood and constantly changing? There is no solid ground. And where there is no solid ground, there is no possibility of contentment. There is only one subtle fracture attached to another. If a man truly seeks to become immune to what others think of him, he will have to be willing to drop the nonsense. He will have to be willing to see that it is his very own fragmented nature that compels him to turn toward others. He will have to be willing to see that whatever others may give him will soon wash away with the shifting sands. He will have to be willing to see that it is only once he becomes whole within himself that he will no longer need anything from anyone else. And he will have to be willing to see that in order to become whole within himself. He will have to go on a journey to see through all the things that he is not, but has, for the whole of his life, believed himself to be. Man was created to be a universe unto himself, but he becomes the universe only once he recognizes that he is not a self at all. In any field, there are the common, and there are the few. There are those who practice a vocation, and there are those who make it an art form. There are those who see five feet in front of them, 
and there are those who see light years into the future. Why? We are told, because they are more intelligent. Whenever I hear that phrase, I don't respond. And the reason I don't respond is because the ensuing discussion goes nowhere. The reason I don't respond is because the person who makes that statement feels that it is actually a viable answer. While I feel that it is actually the beginning of a question. Have you noticed that in this world, everyone hides behind something? The lecturer hides behind the controlled environment of his PowerPoint slides. The teacher hides behind the corroboratory information in the textbooks he cites. The novelist hides behind his ability to control the chronology of seemingly random events. And the nonfiction author hides behind his terminologies and graphs and scientific jargon. Almost all such avenues of information are essentially drive-bys. They make a claim and then justify it by carefully chosen scientific evidence, which supports their own claim. Unless something is in the wild, off the cuff, or on the spot, it's not an intelligent communication of ideas. It's a skit. The world equates intelligence with information. If someone knows a lot about something, he is known as intelligent. Or if someone is well-read, he is intelligent. Or if someone has a 4.0, he is intelligent. Know-how, knowledge, and performance indeed demonstrates proficiency. But is it really intelligence? And if it is intelligence, is it the ultimate intelligence that a human being is capable of experiencing? These are the things that I've been exploring for years. Now, do you see why I remain silent? When someone says that so and so is intelligent. Intertwined with the idea of intelligence is the ego of being intelligent. And this puts a ceiling on one's intelligence. But we'll save that for another time. Let's explore the source of ultimate human intelligence. There have been moments in your life in which you came up with a truly rare idea or a brilliant solution. Where did this come from? You might say, well, it came from me. I'm intelligent, so I thought of it. To which I would reply, very well. If you are so intelligent, then why is this not an everyday occurrence? If it's under your conscious control, why would you not use this intelligence every day? Why wouldn't you create 100 brilliant world-changing ideas every afternoon? Why wouldn't you? You see, we return once again to a running thread that pervades human logic. And that is this. If it comes from me, I'm the one who created it. Anyone who subscribes to this, which is basically almost everyone, will function from a place of very limited intelligence. They may have greater intelligence relative to their friends and peers, but it will pale in comparison to what is truly possible for them. Allow me to ask you this. What is a lamp without electricity? What is a sailboat without wind? What is a plant without sunlight? Let me be frank. Human beings by themselves are very limited creatures. And perhaps something within them recognizes this limitation, thus spawning the need to create an ego of being intelligent in order to make up for the feeling of emptiness. Getting back to my original question, why is it that some in a given field are visionaries and artists while others are average? I will tell you, and it has nothing to do with what the science magazines tell you. It has nothing to do with their brains. You can look at Einstein's brain in a formalin-filled jar and hallucinate all the subtle differences that will conveniently support the presupposed claim of his great intelligence. But in the end, these will be hallucinations, and their only significance will be to further sensationalize age-old stories. The reason that some are visionaries and artists is not because they are more intelligent. It is because they are more available. What do I mean? What I mean is this. Brilliant ideas, genius inventions, and world-changing insights are around us all the time. Even at this very moment, they hover in the ether. But the vast majority of humans do not see, hear, or feel them. Why? Because their degree of craving is minuscule while the visionary artist hasn't thought of anything else in 20 years. 
the whole of his energies and every chamber of his heart has literally been donated to the search. And this is the price he pays for the brilliant insights which literally float into his mind. But he doesn't pay the price consciously or strategically. He simply doesn't have a choice. It is his natural default. It is his DNA. This extreme degree of being available to the ether is the key to the vault. Understand this. That which comes from you will be limited. That which flows through you will be divine. In this way, ultimate intelligence is not a creation, but an availability. It is not a form of action, but a form of surrender. It is not found at an office desk between the hours of nine and five. It is found in the brutal heat of the Sahara under a quarter moon at 2.37 a.m. If you understand this, you will stop searching for intelligence amidst the latticework of your thoughts. Instead of filling yourself with effort, you will make yourself empty so that the truth may enter. Instead of creating clever answers, you will begin forming exquisite questions. Instead of bolstering your persona with the idea of being intelligent, you will become less of yourself in exchange for becoming more of the ultimate. Ultimate intelligence is not that which you consciously create. It is that which you wholeheartedly tap into. It is only the man who is willing to let go of his idea of being intelligent that becomes privy to nature's greatest secrets. And this, my friend, is nature's cruel and genius design. A man may travel the far corners of the earth and find not a single genuine human. Stand witness to a social gathering. Should you have the eyes and the heart to see it, and you will find not a single true human in the room. Laughter hides pain. Smiles conceal wounds. Intelligence conceals insecurities. In some ways, a human longs for nothing more than to be seen. In other ways, it is his greatest fear. Listen to the words being spoken. They are a word salad. Predictable reactions to trite statements. Gossip. Loathing. Resentment. Outrage. Hyperinflated joy. Forced laughter. Mock kindness. A husband and wife demonstrating an air of matrimonial harmony. Concealing the years of discord. The lonely type. Seeking companionship. The attention addict making jokes in a desperate attempt to garner laughter, as if his life depended upon it. The good man, excessively displaying manners, kindness, and good graces, to an extent far beyond that which he would do in a non-social setting. The cultured man speaking in different languages and demonstrating a suspiciously inflated appreciation for the waitstaff. The intellectual, asking others if they have read books, carefully choosing the titles with which he is most familiar so that the conversation may allow him the perfect and most convenient opportunity to matter-of-factly display his knowledge of the topic. Every social gathering is an escape from pain and a salacious bid at pleasure. Humans spend their lives hiding from themselves. It is why mood-altering ingested liquids and substances are rampant in every corner of the globe. Ask a man why he failed, and he will spout a dozen ready-made excuses with such precision that it becomes abundantly clear that he has rehearsed them to perfection. Ask a man why he succeeded, and he will say it is because of luck, hard work, or his intelligence. The truth is, neither of them knows, but they cannot bring themselves to admit this. The only human being who publicly says, I do not know, is the one who uses this to proudly demonstrate how humble he is. There is enormous ego in egolessness. The man who has found spirituality has not truly found it for itself. He has found within it a jewel of a possibility. He has found within it a way to sound selfless while secretly gaining the pleasure of selfishness. What a great luxury spirituality has provided. It is no wonder that it has become all the rage. Serve others, be kind, forgive, keep a gratitude journal, love all, practice loving kindness, 
conscious capitalism. Be charitable. Give away all your money. The Four Noble Truths can be bought off the shelf for $3.95. The Ten Commandments can be had for even less. But Buddha and Jesus are not Buddha and Jesus only in public. Buddha and Jesus are Buddha and Jesus when there is no one around. Buddha may speak of kindness, the Four Noble Truths, and various other anemic and wholly impotent prescriptions in order to appease the masses. But in the quiet of a cave, sitting before a man who genuinely seeks the truth, his words would be very different. Revealing truths to the masses does not create enlightened humans. It creates parrots. The desire to be good and noble and holy and spiritual is a charade. It is, at its grain and fundament, a desire to be seen as such. A human is a cowardly egomaniac. He will sell his own mother if it would support his self-image. There is not a thing that he does that is not centered in ego. When he is with others, he attempts to show off while making all attempts to conceal his intentions. When is alone, he imagines himself being celebrated and liked by others. Let a man examine his life with a genuine eye, and he will not find but a morsel that is truth. Not even the love for his children has been spared by his ego. It is a love-like thing. But who in the mass of humanity is ready for such raw truths? A man may travel the far corners of the earth and find not a single genuine human, one who is neither boastful or humble, one whose self-conflicts, should they exist, center around his own internal detections of ego rather than from the shame of having been caught displaying it to others, one who is so smitten by his own insecurities that he is devoted to discovering their sources, one who has nothing to give to or take from humans, having seen that there is nothing they can possibly give to him, one who lives in a quiet and innocent shame for not yet having naturally arrived at what Buddha and Jesus did, one who believes neither in his own goodness or badness, recognizing that any and all self-images are but shameless lies, one who is so devoted to learning that teaching happens by accident. Having removed all veils, a man looks into the mirror and feels not the slightest familiarity or kinship with the one who looks back at him. Those who are unsuccessful could be successful. Those who are successful could be great. Those who are great could be legends. They are all missing a truth. Well, in actuality, they are missing several truths. I will share one of these truths with you here today. Here it is. Man is not comfortable unless he invents struggles. If a man is working toward a lofty goal, if he is told that it is clear sailing, that nothing is in his way, and all hurdles have been removed, he will not feel comfortable with this. This may sound good to him, but it will not be acceptable to him. Such a thought will be so intolerable, in fact, that he will invent struggles in order to feel more comfortable. Why? Why would any sane human do such a thing? It must first be understood that man is not a sane human being. He is a conditioned one. I will reveal to you a fact. Man has absolutely no cognition or recognition of this fact, but it is precisely the place from which he functions. The fact is an unspoken internal belief system, one that is in the air that he breathes. He has inherited it from his parents, teachers, coaches, gurus, books, media, and every person he has ever met. If you put a gun to this man's head and insisted that he tell you the absolute truth without withholding a single thought, no matter how crazy or embarrassing or self-defeating it may sound, this is what he would say if he valued his life. Listen, there has to be some form of struggle. No one gets anywhere without hard work and toil and years and years of pain, failure, disappointment, and struggle. Nothing is smooth sailing. And even if you were to clear the way for me, I just cannot accept this. It isn't right. It's just plain wrong. Struggle, sweat, 
hard work, and grinding has to be there, or large-scale achievements cannot be had. Let us speak truth. I will not abandon you as all the others have done, by leaving you with a drive-by sort of philosophy and letting you fend for yourself. I will remain with you on this. Point by point, I will look you in the eye as I speak, as I try to convince you of nothing, but state the absolute truth just as it is. A healthy portion of the thousands of minds that are reading this are hoping for something. They are hoping that I will make at least a token concession that hard work is needed, for only then will they be able to take me seriously. Only then will they be able to breathe a sigh of relief that I am one of them. And now that I am one of them, they can now allow themselves to listen. I will address this in the following way. I take no stance on things. For if I take a stance on something, I will be forced to defend my position. And this act of defending my position will take me away from the truth. My allegiance is never to any man, group, or philosophy. And it certainly isn't to myself. On with the truth. Man believes in working his way up. This is manufactured struggle. This is inventing extra rungs on the ladder. This is inventing hurdles on the track. This is inventing a headwind on a calm and sunny day. Understand this. Of all the struggles that any human being, successful or unsuccessful, has had to face, the overwhelming majority of them are invented. Are there some natural setbacks that occur? Yes. Are there things that do not go according to plan? Yes. Are there falls along the way? Yes. But these are very small in number. Man has a habit of making small things seem big. In order to give himself the feeling of conquest for a win, or the feeling of resilience for a loss. I will restate the truth. Man is not comfortable unless he invents struggles. An athlete who seeks to become a professional looks at the traditional path of getting there. When there are paths that he may have never looked sufficiently outside the box to consider, and if he dares to take the first step toward this path, a siren sounds. The world of people, friends, parents, coaches, teachers, media drop everything and run toward him. They line the sidewalk by the thousands and spout their traditional and predictable nonsense. The teacher says, make sure you get your education first. The parent says, make sure you have a backup plan in case you don't make it. The coach says, it's a hard road. Less than 1% make it. Give it a try, but you don't know how good those pros really are. The media says, he doesn't have the size, the strength, or the pedigree for it. And why would these people not say these things? Firstly, they likely never had the courage to dream big, so they settled for a traditional life of struggle and making ends meet. Secondly, even if they did have the courage to dream big, they became victims of these very same people, and they failed because of it. And to a degree, they cannot be blamed. How can a man possibly allow himself to believe that someone else is going to make it, when he himself did not? Their invented struggles ruined them. The one who succeeds also invents struggles. It is just that either he has not invented quite as many, or he simultaneously developed a self-image of resilience in order to overcome his invented struggles. What is the path to becoming successful, or great, or a legend? The path is to first become sincere. Discover for yourself if you truly wish to know the truth. If you do, then explore which of your struggles are truly natural. Discover which struggles are flames that you truly do not fan and then examine which struggles you have invented without the slightest bit of self-blame or condemnation. For if you condemn yourself, you will create more excuses and thus more struggles. Discover which of the struggles you were conditioned by society to create. A good sign is this. If society 
and the people around you support and endorse the struggle, you can be assured that it is invented. There are many other truths that involve recesses of your mind that the world simply hasn't come to know. There are places within your mind that if they are so much as recognized, you will have no choice but to leap into a new level of being. But for now, I will leave you to examine your invented struggles so that you may begin to see just how readily within your grasp it is to become a legend in your field. I have always aimed to create the one refuge in the world where there exists nothing but pure truth, no nonsense, no BS, no silliness, no jargon, no prescriptions, no tips, just the truth, only for the serious. George Lucas is no doubt a seeker. It cannot be otherwise. He took the beautiful ancient secret of prana from Indian mythology and gloriously splashed it across the silver screen as the force. Prana, you see, is the life force. In the Orient, they call it chi. Pranayama is believed to be exercises in breathing. This is yet another example of sacred truths that have been commercialized and bastardized, even within the very countries in which they originated. Pranayama has really nothing to do with breathing, in the same way that yoga is not really about asanas. Pranayam is the voluntary internalization of the life force which exists all around us. The force is called prana. By the way, should you do it? No, because anything that you do because of a should is a complete and utter waste of time. The same goes for meditation. And if you're doing it for your health, you'll get the same benefit as eating a half-eaten apple. And it's a lot easier to eat the apple. Let us examine with the truth to becoming a bona fide Jedi master. For starters, shall we leave telekinesis out of it for now? I've been asked a number of times if I've learned to move objects with my mind. I've also been asked about the quickest way to read people's minds and how to instantly switch off involuntary thought and even how to levitate. There's something you should know and it's enormously telling about the relationship between the Jedi of Star Wars and the way in which legendary masters were trained in the ancient East. For instance, do you know what they used to say about the warrior monks of the Shaolin Temple of Hunan Province, China? A Shaolin monk is master of himself. He walks through walls. He can be seen, but he cannot be touched. When he walks, he cannot be heard. Sound familiar? You see, my friend, the Jedi Master didn't just exist in Star Wars. They were, and they are, a real and true thing. Why is it so rare for someone to become a Jedi? The reason it is so rare is because of the culture. The culture of your industry. The culture of your family. The culture of the society. And most importantly, the culture that exists inside your mind. You want brutal honesty? The brutal honesty is this. Almost every adult human being on this planet is incurably doomed. Why? Because they have taken such a beating from the culture of their own industry that they will simply never be the same. The lies and the propaganda that have been played like a running loop in their mind have penetrated so deep that it has quite literally changed the anatomic arrangements of their neural networks. My friend, almost no one recovers from such a beating. Almost no one comes back from such a purgatory. The reason that I say almost is because there are always the exceptions. And those glorious exceptions are the princes of mankind. Those glorious exceptions are ready to receive the truth. Those glorious exceptions have the qualifications to become a living, breathing Jedi. And for the ones who have been incurably brainwashed by their culture, this will be nothing more than an entertainment. The remainder of this discourse is, quite frankly, exclusively for those glorious exceptions of mankind. What is a Jedi? A Jedi is master of himself. What does this mean? This means that he controls the universe around him. You heard it as you read it. The Jedi has learned to control the universe around him. The things that may affect others do not affect him. The rules that apply to others do not apply to him. For some incredible reason, 
the very way that nature looks at him is different than the way it looks everyone else. The Jedi has broken through to a new sphere of existence. He has cracked the code, and he lives within the cocoon of a new earth, whilst walking on the ground with mere mortals who would scarce understand the possibilities that exist for a human being. What powers has the Jedi achieved? Unspeakable ones. If I revealed the mystical powers of the Jedi, if I sat down and told you the freakish capabilities he has achieved, it would send your mind into a tailspin. I'll go a bit easier on you and reveal to you some that are equally powerful, but perhaps more graspable. One, a Jedi has graduated to such a level that emotions can no longer ensnare him. Emotions are available to him, but they cannot so much as lay a finger on him without his consent. Two, as a result, he has become permanently cured of all the anxieties that torment mere mortals on an almost hourly basis. Three, he is able to give to his family and anyone who comes to see him precisely what they need when they need it. He knows what to say, how much to give, when to shelter and comfort, when to set loose. And he knows this because he has attained that most elusive of superhuman qualities, clarity. Four, all of his actions stem from wisdom. They are bathed in wisdom. They are sheathed in wisdom. It is not that he practices it or attempts to do the right thing. The wisdom simply surfaces at the right time without him having to do anything at all. Five, he has gone through a secret training that the ancients were banned from ever speaking about to the uninitiated, and he himself has been sworn to secrecy. For there are some revelations which when given to one who is unprepared become very dangerous to one's constitution. Six, all conflicts have disappeared. When other humans come to fight or to argue with him, the minute they come within five yards of him, their ill will suddenly vanishes. It is as if there is an invisible shield around him that protects him wherever he goes. How does this happen? Very well, I'll reveal something to you. Psst. All conflict is self-conflict. Seven, his career and his success are in the palm of his hand because he no longer has interference. His destiny is now in his own hands, not theoretically or philosophically, but as a present day reality. Eight, while his fellow human beings suffer the unending torment of getting in their own way, he sails toward the horizons of his very own choosing. Why? Because he has learned the secret of making his mind retreat when he needs it to retreat and come forward when he needs it for his own personal use. Nine, the mind is the ultimate slave master of man. And this Jedi has been led by the hand inch by inch compartment by compartment, through the mind's inner machinery. He has been taught its locations, its hiding places, and its inner workings. He has been trained to see when it is coming and how to avoid its assaults. As a result of this training, the mind now sits by his side as a somewhat spherical pulsating ball of fire that he can employ at moment's notice to satisfy even his most fantastical wishes. 10. Number 10 is teetering on the limits which divide this world from the one that you haven't yet seen. The ancients did this quite regularly, and I'll confess to you in this moment that this is one of the ethereal and mystical powers that has served me in my quest for truth, and which has allowed me to share insights with select others. It is a force to which I am eternally grateful, for not in a thousand years could I have known the, albeit small number, of magical insights that have the power of transforming a man's life condition into one that he has never before known. It is this power that leads me to say that it is not I who does what I do. It does not come from me. Rather, it happens through me. What is this power? I'll say it once and allow it to hang in the air when I want to know something, when I need an insight. I do not read a book or analyze it with my intellect. And as for intellect, I realize that you've always been taught that it is your greatest weapon. 
I realize that it is a deep source of pride for societal men, and I realize that men have no choice but to rely upon it. The reason that they have no choice but to rely upon it is because they have not discovered the glorious power which puts the intellect to shame. It has been available to me for the whole of my life, and I am not the only one. What is this mysterious power? To simply download the knowledge that you seek from the universe around you, like downloading part of a hard disk onto a flash drive. Man has learned to walk, but there are a few men who have secretly learned how to fly. They say that all men are created equal. Is this true? Perhaps in theory, but so few are the men or women who set off on that one journey to claim the frankly magical capabilities that were set aside for them, that the statement has very little practical value. I will close with the following truths. For those who tell you that there are no secrets, they have either not discovered them or they seek to keep you oblivious of them. If you seek the truth, and I mean the truth, about how to become a Jedi Master. If you seek the truth about cures rather than treatments. If you seek the truth about navigating your life to a horizon of precisely your own choosing. If you seek the truth about anything and everything that you feel is foundational to your existence and intimately near and dear to your heart. You won't find them in any of the traditional places. I won't try to convince you of this. I'll allow the statement to stand on its own. Are all such things available to you? Yes, but they do come at a price, the greatest of which is visceral sincerity, the unshakable desire to know. And let me tell you this, psychologists, coaches, psychotherapists, motivational speakers, preachers, parents, friends, and priests will trip over themselves to help you but no master worth his salt will give a man the time of day unless he personally sees the fireball of sincerity in his eyes. When he sees the one who is dying to know, he will bring him into his coveted space in a small and private corner of the world and make him privy to the secrets that are man's birthright, but few ever set out to claim. I bow to Master Yoda for reserving his wisdom for the genuine and the sincere.